Hi there, I'm Donna Gans. I'm the National Lymphoma Nurse Manager with Lymphoma Australia and we're coming to you from ASH 2019 in Orlando, Florida and I'm joined this morning with um, Dr Simon Rule from um, Plymouth in the UK. Hi Simon, thanks for joining me. Pleasure, nice to be here. Thanks. Um, we, I'll just sort of get a little bit in, um, insights into some of your thoughts on the update um, on mantle cell lymphoma. Um, that's your specialty and main, uh, main area of interest. Um, yeah, so what things have you come about so far? So a couple of things. I mean, there's been um, extended data in ibrutinib. So I presented a poster with a seven and a half year follow-up of patients on, the, on, on ibrutinib, single agent for mantle cell lymphoma. Important information really showing no late toxicity. So if you're on the drug, you don't see emerging side effects, which is important for patients to know. There are a number of patients, just under 10% who are still on the drug out of the original 370. I've got a couple of patients who've been on the drug almost eight years now. So you do see some very long responders. Yeah. I think one of the important messages from this analysis is we've looked at how long people get a response to ibrutinib based on how long they had a response to their previous line of therapy. Oh, okay. And generally with lymphoma, and this applies with follicular uh, as well as mantle cell lymphoma, when you give chemotherapy, the next time you give chemotherapy, you don't get as good a response. You know, so your best treatment is your first treatment. It gets less and less benefits. So what we showed was with the patients that got the best response with chemotherapy, who then got ibrutinib, they're the ones who got the best response to ibrutinib. And generally that was at least a year longer than they'd had with their chemotherapy. So this is a complete step change. So seeing a treatment that works better than your first one is unusual. It's very reassuring for patients, but it basically just proves that you should use this drug as early as possible in the relapse situation, which kind of begs the question, what happens when you use the drug frontline? And of course, we have a big study running in the UK right now, and uh, it'll be a while before we know the answer to that. But one of the other trials that was presented here was one I've been doing with a, a friend of mine in France, Steve Leguil, where we've been combining ibrutinib, venetoclax, like it's happened in Melbourne, of course, mm. together with an antibody, abinutuzumab, frontline. Yeah. So we treated 15 patients, 14 of them are in an MRD negative complete remission, including high-risk patients who had P53 abnormalities. So the worst patients going into a complete remission with this combination of the drugs. So to my mind, this is, this is where we're going and uh, do we need chemotherapy at all? I think mantle cell, unlike all the other lymphomas, is the one where chemotherapy is going to be, uh, I think, of the past, the quickest. Uh, certainly, we know with follicular lymphoma, you give chemotherapy, you get very, very long remissions. Patients are well for a long period of time off treatment. It's difficult to challenge that right now. Diffuse large B cell, nothing really better than our chop. Uh, and, but for mantle cell, um, I think we're challenging chemotherapy right now, and these new combinations could be very exciting. Are there certain patient, uh, mental cell patients would probably respond uh, better without having chemotherapy compared to other patients? Well, generally, we, um, we consider those who have the P53 mutation to be the worst patients. That's yeah. around 6 to 8%. And we know those patients don't respond well to chemotherapy, don't generally respond well to ibrutinib. So it doesn't matter what you use, it doesn't work very well. Mm. There's some sort of tantalising evidence that this combination gets over that bug, bad prognostic feature. And if that's the case... We won't even need to measure these things if it works in all situations. It's very early, but uh, at least to my mind, this looks to be the way we're going. That sounds fantastic. Is there uh, much of a, a side effect toxicity profile with these drugs? Combination? Yeah, as soon as you put combinations together, you get more than... I mean, I, I, I don't like this term chemo-free. I mean, drugs that kill cells, it's, I mean, it doesn't matter what you call them. I think we have to be specific about side effects for different treatment regimens, OK? And chemotherapy means drugs that kill cells, and uh, there are lots of drugs that we now call chemo-free, which, in fact, are chemotherapy. So I, I think that term's not very useful. But, yeah, when you add venetoclax to a brutinib, which looks to be the... The, the best combination you get you get neutropenia you get some gi toxicity some diarrhea some indigestion uh, i think as we start to learn how to use these combinations we'll get smarter at dose reducing and um, you know giving additional medications to make that tolerable they won't be on these drugs forever that's the other potentially exciting thing here that if you if you truly get rid of the disease then we have to explore stopping you know and stopping and if, if stopping doesn't come out that's a cure clearly i mean so that's that's where we're going. So I think, first of all, we know these combinations work very well. Yep. There's a nervousness about stopping because it's we don't, ask, you know, yeah. it might be too difficult to retreat if you stop and it comes back. So yeah. I think the next phase of the trial we're going to be running, which we've just been planning, is there'll be a stop. Yeah. 
with a plan to restart if the disease comes back and, and hopefully maybe it won't come back. So that's kind of part of where we're going next. So the trial at the moment is currently just patients have got on that until they progress or, yep. okay, um, but you're looking at maybe a two-year sort of... So, so there's a defined period of the venetoclax yep. and the antibody, but the ibrutinib continues to progression. So, you know, even even a well-tolerated drug like ibrutinib, but as a patient, you'd rather be on nothing. So I think that our goal is to stop everything and maintain complete quality of life. I think that's where we have to go. Fantastic. And have you got any comments on um, CAR-T, cell therapy and mantle cell lymphoma? Uh, you're about three hours too early because that's been presented this afternoon. All right. um, I mean, it, from, from the abstract, it looks it looks highly active. Uh, of course, the, the trouble when you see the first presentation of uh, something novel like CAR T cell is always a highly selected group of patients. This is largely from one centre, so you always have to take it with a pinch of salt. You know, when you're translating that into to the real world, if you like, it's never going to be as good. And of course, there are issues about deliverability of CAR T cell. And it's a very expensive technology, of course. So I think, it, I think it will find a place if you can do it. If the if the responses are durable, in other words, you cure people. You know, you could you could certainly see it replacing an alginate stem cell transplant, for example. I mean, we don't do that very often, but we know we cure some patients with that. So if mm. if it's as good as that and less toxic, then that, there's a place. So I think it's one of these. It's it's, it's tantalising. It's, potentially exciting but I, I just want to wa watch a little bit from the sidelines and see how yeah. it pans out because it might be that combinations of simple oral drugs might be, might be just as good. Okay. Um, do you usually send a lot of your patients to Allo? Very few. Um, we, we know with the P53 group of patients, young patients are so about 6 to 8 percent. If you give them chemotherapy, you do an autologous stem cell transplant, they relapse early and they do badly and if you give them a brutinib, it doesn't work very well. So in that setting, uh, that's the only group of patients I actually check it. So if I find P53 mutation in a young patient, I will do an as my first treatment. So I'll get them into remission, then I'll do an alginate stem cell transplant. Now, that's controversial. Um, yeah. A lot of people don't believe that's what you should do, but in my opinion, that's your best chance of, of getting disease control and potentially curing patients. Thank you, um, Simon. That's fantastic insight. And um, hopefully we'll find out a little bit more this afternoon with that session. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Nice to be here.